First, I started out challenging the, the alphabet, as we know it today, um, which later led on to uh, thank you. which later led on to merging the alphabet with the uh, Chinese uh, Chinese characters. Um, so basically, what I wanted to investigate was how do we read, and uh, is there any way we can maybe a, maybe a better alphabet, and is there a way to combine two existing written systems into a new, uh, and is it really, really what we want? So, this is a very personal project. As a child, I was very bad at, at reading and writing, but I still loved to write, and I, uh, I wrote pretty much as, uh, as I thought the words um, should be written. And, um, um, and and I, I felt like I was uh, giving these uh, building blocks, just like label blocks, that I was capable to use however I wanted, and build stories and put together to great words. But but when it, when when I showed it to other people, people would either laugh or tell me it was wrong. So it's like I had this great great tool that I couldn't use the way I found fit. I wanted to do this to to. Um, uh, to to see if I could make some more, you know, some stronger and more recognizable word pictures. And um, if we look at uh, here's some examples of uh, of uh, word pictures, some more recognizable than others. Uh, this is three different ways of writing human being. Uh, we have the Chinese one character human being, and they have fifty uh, thousand uh, characters um, in their written system. And in English we have twenty eight. And I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty strong uh, word picture. You'll be able to recognize it pretty, pretty quickly. But if you only use two characters, you get this very long, not, not recognizable um, word picture. So there's some kind of connection between amount of characters and how s uh, specific they can, they can target a, a meaning, and thereby how strong a word, word picture will, uh, will look. So I wanted to, uh, to, to make these new uh, letter, uh, letters and letter combinations um, uh, and I, I therefore looked into uh, ligatures because ligatures already exist in, in our existing alphabet and in things we have these, see if I can, this is an A, oh, and then we have the, the French OE, <laughs> uh, which is actually new characters but in a way it's um, it's ligatures because you can see they, they they come from two existing characters merged together. Um, so I made this model which uh, divide ligatures and letters. So for instance, if you look at the ampersand, you have the uh, the italic edition where you can really see the e and the t, and in the uh, Roman edition where it's more uh, like a new character. I wanted to uh, to make both kind of of uh, letters in my new uh, in my new uh, alphabet, and um, so I call it phase one and phase two, and then I started drawing, and um, my um, my phase one was very direct. It's pretty easy to see. You have a B and an E squeezed together, and you have a N and a G, and and so forth. And when I tested this on people, it showed that pretty quickly people would be able to read phase two letters. Actually, with no introduction at all. They would they would read it, uh, if not as quick as normally, then almost as quick as normally. Um, so here is the new letters I created for the alphabet, and um, the first ones is vowels and uh, vowels together. Um, no, sorry, vowels and consonants, and the consonants and consonants, and then in the bottom we have. Uh, visual ligatures, for instance, R and N in a very small scale may end up look like uh, an M. Um, so, so when I had these, I created the ones in the middle. I call them the concept ligatures or the concept letters, because if you have the rule rule of an NG looking a certain way and an IN or an IN, then an R and G would look like that, and so forth. So it's like this is just they they, they came as a product of the rules created before them. And because this is not a typeface project, it's a letter project. It's more, 
maybe not linguistic, but I was trying to design letters and not typefaces. So I had to do it in, in uh, Helvetica and Times New Roman, since these would be the two most widely used um, typefaces. And also, uh, uh, they are both different as uh, stamps and, uh, and serif font. Yes. So, um, I like to do a little test on this to see if you're actually able to read it, just to make sure that I'm not just standing here saying that it's able, like Gimbal able to read this. So, if you would all just raise your hand as soon as, as you have decoded the word on the screen, then I know when I can go on. Okay? Okay, I made my case. <laughs> well, actually, I think what it really tells us about is how much we can do with the written system we already have and still be able to, uh, to, to comprehend it. We saw it earlier where you had words, uh, letters scrambled up in words and you're still able to read it. And that's because of the, like, the importance of word, word pictures. So this didn't really um, solve my last question, like my last need to pick up a book and look at it. And I thought that Chinese might be the right way to look, because as we already heard, Chinese has pictographic value. Um, some of the characters look like the, uh, the objects they represent and the meaning. So I wanted to look into this uh, and, and, and see if, if that might be a, a right direction to go also concerning the alphabet. Yeah. Um, Working in, uh, in New York two years ago, I, um, I came upon these flyers in Chinatown. And I think, I think it was because I was in this safe environment where I'm able to read the signs and, and understand what people are saying, uh, that all of a sudden this seemed like a huge communication gap, like a wall in my face. I got these flyers in New York and I wasn't able to read it. Um, and this kind of uh, really uh, understand how, how, uh, how big a communication gap there is between two so important cultures as the Western and, and, and Eastern uh, culture and also in, a, in, in terms of communication in, in general. Um, yeah. um, this is from Hong Kong. Uh, Hong Kong is also one of the places where you have a lot of uh, different, uh, uh, or you have two very prominent different languages coming together. Um, from a graphic designer's point of view, this is, this is a mess. Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, if you look at this, you, f you feel like there's a much more information in Chinese than just the OK, right? And, and the whole construction of the, the characters are so, so different that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very hard work to, to make this seem um, uh, harmonious and, 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 and beautiful, make the characters come together in a beautiful way. Um, so first, a, a bit about Chinese writing. We have, we have already heard um, uh, about the, um, uh, s some, of, some of the terms, but basically Chinese characters uh, can be categorized into pictograms, which represent a specific object, an ideogram, which represents a concept, for instance, something can contain something else, be above something, or be liquid. There's uh, a, 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 a vast variety of these ideograms. Or logograms, which represents one word, for instance, paragraph, uh, uh, dollar, and euro, so forth. That's, that's how we use logograms in, in, in the alphabet, anyway. And then phonograms. But to make this even more confusing, this is just like the building blocks, blocks of Chinese. These can be combined in numerous ways. So you can have, for instance, a pictogram defining uh, uh, what are we talking about, and then have another pictogram put together and then change into a phonogram telling you how it's pronounced. I'm not going to tell you more about that, but it is very complicated. So why don't we just write Chinese using the alphabet? or write, write uh, English using Chinese, for instance. Um, and it all comes down to uh, the spoken language. Um, Chinese has approximately 1,600 uh, syllables in its spoken language. 
English has 10,000. So in English, you can write things down uh, based on pronunciation very precisely, because the spoken language is very diverse. For instance, here you see three very different meanings. And if you look at the Chinese written in pinyin, pinyin as it's called, uh, written with, the, with the, the alphabet here, you can see they're all pronounced in the same way, even with the same tone. So in Chinese, it would look as different as these three characters. So the precision you might not have in the spoken language, which of course is also supported by gestures, you have in the, in the written language. So I still wanted to, to kind of combine these two, or at least understand the differences between them. Um, so the first thing I, I did was to look into the basic strokes, the basic uh, uh, construction of each language. And if you look into the alphabet, the alphabet is basically constructed by eight uh, different strokes. These can combine into the, the ten numbers we use, uppercase and lowercase letters, and even special characters as the Danish characters I showed you earlier. The same thing goes for Chinese, actually. It's also based upon only eight basic strokes. These can be combined into 29 complex strokes, and then 214 uh, keys or radicals that then can be combined in numerous ways to the 15,000 uh, 15, characters. So I thought it was, this was kind of fun that they were actually both constructed from the same amount of information, if you may. And uh, I took these uh, basic strokes and combined them into to one letter to, or into one character uh, shape to, to really see the, the impact of the basic strokes. And I think, I think these two shapes is very interesting because there's really no doubt about what, what shape belongs to what written system. I mean, the European one looks very European. And the same with the Chinese. It's actually the character for water, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Please correct me. Um, yeah, and, and you can see this, this in play. No matter, this is just two random characters. You can take any random uh, alphabet and Chinese characters. And it's the basic strokes. It's the dynamics of those you see come to, to play in the, in, in the characters. Yeah. So what I wanted to do was to try, and, try and, and, and merge it and mix it together and see what would happen with the alphabet if we, if we added in some of the Chinese dynamic and like the Chinese uh, strokes and shapes. So I took um, six Chinese characters that has some resemblance to uh, alphabetic characters. Oh, sorry, over here. And then I redrew them into uh, matching this uh, typeface I used um, and um, to have the same, the same darkness uh, and the same uh, uh, take of uh, approximately the same space as an alphabetic character would. Um, and I'm going to test again, so you don't have to read it out loud, though it's very nice, but you can also just raise your hand if you want. So let's see if, if we can uh, read, read this. <laughs> So this, I, I, I mean, it really does something with the Latin alphabet. It looks very, very different. It, it's still readable, but it really looks different. And it's, it's only by changing some of the, the, the basic strokes it's, it's made from. So this was looking into the construction, like the inner construction. The next thing I wanted to look into was the way Chinese characters is combined by other characters and how they can combine them. We have the ligatures in the alphabet where they have two characters written very closely together uh, and then almost being drawn into a new one. But in Chinese, they, they, they scoop them together and then they place them on, on top of each other and they really make very, very complex um, um, new characters from existing characters. And they only take up the same amount of space. So, so the, the character only has like, one, one size. Um, so I wanted to see if I could maybe understand this better by doing the same thing to the alphabet or maybe make strong word pictures also by having this approach to the alphabet. Yeah. 
Um, and the last thing I want to look into was what really uh, got my interest in the beginning of when it comes to Chinese characters, and it's the assemblance with the objects they represent. So for instance, here we have mountain. And what I wanted to do here was to try and make a new uh, way of, of writing, of, of, of telling a story. So I basically took Chinese characters, placed them um, in relation to each other, so that they created more like a narrative, uh, more a situation, uh, you might say, than, than text you read from left to right. So this is not read from left to right, but maybe from middle out, or just seen as the uh, characters in relation. So here, for instance, I call this one isolation. It's pretty simple. It's a human being in the middle of a brick, brick wall surrounded by a mountain chain. Um, we could put ladder or something else in as well, just to make sure that he doesn't get anywhere. But this one, yeah. So pretty straightforward. You see, it's not it's not written. It's more watched upon as as one composition. This one is border communication gap, long distance relationship. It could be anything really. Uh, what you have is a man up in your left corner and a female in your lower right corner, and then in between you have the sign for a tree, sign for forest, and another sign for forest that's a more dense sign, where you basically just have three trees on top of each other, so you have two tre trees and three trees on top of each other. And that way, creating the, um, a gradient and a sense of distance uh, and very dense forest between the two. I wanted to, um, to, uh, to make a, a composition describing um, <coughs> obstacle, because I mean this project is all about overcoming an obstacle of communication between two worlds. So I thought it would be nice if I had a man standing on one side of a wall of flames and a woman on the other side, and then a dragon in between them, right? So the, the man would have to slay the dragon to, to get to the princess, which is, I mean, that's, everybody knows that. So that's just how it is, right? So I showed this work to a Chinese guy, and he didn't get it at all. He was totally puzzled. <laughs> and I, I, uh, I just like, Okay, come on, I, I explained him. You know, the prince had to slay the dragon, go to the girl, free her, and say, no, 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 dragons can never be evil. Dragons are good, we're all children of dragons. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you, can, you can feel as international as you will, but you will always, I mean, it, 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 this was, a, this was a, a really good reminder of me of how much cultural heritage I bring into a project like this. Um, even though I'm trying to reach the other side, I have so much cultural heritage with me, no matter what I do. And, uh, and I mean, that's the good thing about knowing Chinese people <laughs> and having them to review your work. Um, apparently, this has never been done with Chinese characters before, and I, I'm serious, please come to me and tell me if I'm wrong, because uh, I don't want to state something which is a lie, but I've showed it to a number of different people now, and. Uh, none of them have seen their characters used in a way which is not related to reading in this way, but still is a kind of reading. So, if you see it, please come and tell me. Otherwise, I'll still keep claiming that I did this. Um, I mean, this when when stuff like this happens, I think this is a very good reminder of of how much you can uh, achieve by working with stuff you don't know too much about. It might sound stupid, and it might, might sound strange, but because I do not know Chinese, and I do not read and write Chinese, I'm not restricted with the rules within this system. I, I know what I know about Chinese now, because I had to learn it, but I've never, I never really studied. I haven't, it's, it's not on my spine, if you will. So I'm not restricted by these rules, and I think, that's, I think it's a very good quality. Um, and um, yeah. So I ended up doing this one, which I think is relevant for pretty much every culture. It basically says, between he uh, heaven and earth, people are fighting. So maybe not that uplifting, but I think it should be <laughs> representable. So the last experiment I did was basically just taking a, this is a landscape painting, as everyone can see. 
Um, I basically just took the first character of each, each English word and replaced it with the character for the same uh, uh, word in Chinese. So it says sky, horizon, ocean, earth. Um, yeah. So it's, I think this is the simplest solution <laughs> to a bilingual communication. Well, I'm, there's a lot of good reasons to have one common written language, but as I'm sure we're all aware of, there's also a lot of good reasons not to share, uh, not, not to uh, change existing language for new languages. Um, so I'd probably rather talk about that. I mean, to, to create a new language like this, a new written system, I would say, uh, is sure a very ambitious uh, dream and goal, but I think it is, I think it's possible. Of course it is, uh, but to implement it is, of course, a whole other challenge. Um, and, I mean, one day we'll probably all just start speaking English anyway, uh, using the very fast evolving translation tool we have today. Um, well, yeah. Well, language is basically a tool for structuring and sharing thought. and. So I think the, the bigger question is really if you want to live in a world where everybody structure and communicate in the same way and, uh, and nobody would ask us to drink the water machine. So thank you very much.